Greetings, everyone. Um, welcome to the Grow Your Poetry Shop, where the seating may be economy class, but the poetry is, is first rate. Um, yes. We have three poets uh, this evening, and I'll be introducing uh, each one, and then each will read. Um, the first is Wynn Cooper. Cooper is the author of five books of poems, including most recently Mars Poetica, Chaos is the New Calm, and Postcards from the Interior. His first novel, Way Out West, which Margot Livesey calls Spellbinding, debuted last December, but has already entered its third printing. Cooper's poems, essays, stories, and reviews appear regularly in the Paris Review, The New Yorker, Poetry, Slate, as well as in over 100 other magazines, and in 25 anthologies of contemporary poetry. He lives in Vermont and works as an editor. In his poem, Postcard to a Secret Address, Cooper establishes a characteristically intimate fidelity with his reader, asking, are you still as strange as when we courted? And promising, I will write you wherever I am. His poems often provide us with escapes into surrealism and song, into a rhythmic reordering of ordinary life, a music that makes it all the more habitable. In a love poem disguised as a, wire, as a wine buyer's guide, or on an island where the pomegranates are magnets, we enter, quote, a hidden kingdom of wing and prayer, its details too fine to miss or to mess with. Let's welcome Wynne Cooper. Thanks. like being on the tea at rush hour in here. Yes. Um, thank you so much, Heather. And thank you, James, for inviting me. And it's I've never read, oh, I've never read here before. So this is a real thrill for me. Um, and I just wanted to say first that uh, I'm, I'm sure that most of you know that Shane McGowan died yesterday. Um, and I was driving down from Vermont today and listened to three of the Pogues records. Um, and I don't have anything profound to say about him, um, except that he just has meant a lot to me. And I just thought I should mention that. So rest, rest in peace, Shane. Okay, I'm just gonna read a couple poems from each book and then read some new poems. And this is uh, one of my postcard poems. Um, it's called Postcard from Robert Frost's Grave. Um, many of you in here knew Liam Rector. He is in this poem. Many of you knew Linda Gregg. She is in this poem. Um, this was a crazy night when I was asked to show them Robert Frost's Grave in Bennington, Vermont, where I used to live when they were when we were all teaching at Bennington College. Um, the place that's referred to in the poem, The End of the World, is as a part of the Bennington College campus. Postcard from Robert Frost's Grave. Amy was crooning and Linda was swooning the night I brought them here. Her baritone led us in Irish songs of mourning, liquid as the Guinness which helped us sing. Linda asked that we show respect, but the director relieved himself behind two birches that grow near the grave. We were louder than fireworks on the 4th of July, which we watched from the end of the world. We sang along with Amy as Linda rubbed the stone. The northern lights lit up our thoughts, but cops arrived to shut us up. A lover's quarrel with the world, indeed. I forgot to tell you that that's what it says on Robert Frost's grave. Mm -hmm. I had a lover's quarrel with the world. Just, you know, pretty great thing to put on your gravestone. Um, I'm just going to read one or more of these postcard poems. Postcard from the party. I, I guess I should say one of my former students at Marlboro College asked me to write a postcard poem because he was editing a literary magazine and he had suddenly gotten all of these postcard poems in one day, which he thought was really weird. So he just wrote to all of his writer friends and said, write me a postcard poem. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, just write a, a postcard about something or someone weird in your town. 
and I live in Halifax, Vermont, and everything and everyone is pretty weird. So it was very easy for me. And I had such a good time writing postcard from Halifax that I kept going and I wrote about 200 postcard poems, um, starting out with places coming from places in Vermont, then places around the world, places I'd been, places I hadn't been. Then I started writing poems from emotions and states of mind and things like that. So um, this is the last one. Postcard from the party. You have to be invited and there's nothing you can do to be asked. Headlines and bloodlines don't help. It's a long way from home, but I'm here. The view much better than I'm used to. How did this happen? Dumb but good luck. Right place and time. The planets aligned. No contract, no deadline, no risk. And what did I do to deserve this? Slept with all the wrong people. Gambled too much on friends of friends with light bulbs over their heads. Wrote every day, no matter what. Oh man, I'm just going to read. <laughs> this is the book that came after that. These are all loose sonnets. They're all 14 lines. Each one is shaped differently. Um, and they all kind of work as sonnets, I think. Um, and this is the title poem. Chaos is the new calm. Chaos is the new calm. Violence, the new balm. To be spread on lips, unused to a kiss. Left is the new right, as I brace for a fight with a man who stands on his remaining hand. Fetid harbor, harbor me until someone is free to drive me away from what happened today. Don't strand me standing here. If you leave, leave beer. <laughs> That's for Shane. <laughs> uh, okay, and I'm gonna keep moving on here. This is my last book, Mars Poetica, that came out five, five years ago. Um, so I'll read a few poems from this one. This is the title poem, Mars Poetica. Imagine you're on Mars, looking at Earth, a swirl of colors in the distance. Tell us what you miss most or least. Let your feelings rise to the surface. Skim that surface with a tiny net. Now you're getting the hang of it. Tell your story slantwise, streetwise, in the disguise of an astronaut in his suit. Tell us something we didn't know before, how words mean things we didn't know we knew. I always change my mind when I start reading that. Nah, I don't read that one. Um, I mentioned Liam, so um, he was one of my absolute closest friends. Um, he, I don't know if his picture's up here on the wall. It, James, is it? It's in the corner over there. It, it had been taken down by a previous owner, shall we say, <laughs> after he was banned from the store, um, after spending $5,000 here on poetry books, as he figured out later. Um, anyway, sorry, I, I, you know, that's me. I'm such a gossip. Um, so be careful or I'll tell stories about you, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway uh liam has been gone for 16 years i think um and this poem is for him how silent the trees how the hell are you i want to ask but can't you're dead how hard the snow fell how slowly it melts how to tie a knot big enough to choke the wild pain. How to listen carelessly to words used carefully. How answers to questions often contain no answer. How to wind a watch so tight time stops. How silent the trees, how loud the shots of hunters. Um, and this seemed like an appropriate poem to read in a bookstore. I've never read it before, I don't think. It's very, very short. Um, 
It is called Collected Works. A brown cardboard box packed tight with books, no one troubled to read, drifts over our heads, buoyed on the heat of its own invention. I'm going to read some new poems, but first I'm going to read the first paragraph of my novel because I thought it would never happen that I would have a novel and I'm still absolutely thrilled every single day about it. Um, and I don't need to really tell you anything about it. I will just say because um, Concord Free Press did this book and they are unlike any press in the world as far as I know in that every two or three years they publish a book that is completely free to anyone. You go to their website, you ask them for the current free book, they mail it to you, they pay the postage. And it is completely free. There are no strings attached. They do ask, if you're interested, no pressure, um, to give money of in any amount to the charity of your choice or to a person in need. Um, and then also, if you want to, let them know where you gave the money and how much money you gave. And many people have done that, obviously, because they get free books. Um, and Concord Free Press has, as of recently, has raised over five million dollars for charity. Um, my book's not free, <laughs> <laughs> but the money sold by the books that do cost money, like mine, uh, goes toward running the press, which goes toward giving all this, this insane amount of money away. So it's a good cause. And James, you poured me water, but I think I forgot to bring it over here. Do you mind? Thank you so much. The novel is called Way Out West. This is the first paragraph. <clears throat> uh, the first chapter is called Fire and Ice. It begins here in these mountains rising out of the desert. This desert that seems endless in summer and endlessly hot and cold in winter when movie crews spend freezing days filming life elsewhere in the galaxy. This is the moon, they say. Let's get weightless as they pass a bottle of gin around. Even as their vision blurs, they see these mountains clearly in the middle distance. And as they continue to drink, the things around them begin to move to sway, to lose their weight in the lunar night, except the mountains, which remind them of everything that was ever stable in their lives or pleasant or real. I'm gonna read you a few poems from my um, recently completed manuscript, which has yet to have a title, even though Virginia and Martha have helped greatly as I go over and over trying to figure out what it should be called. <clears throat> um, maybe it will just be called Poems. <laughs> um, sure. Picture this, a pasture that rolls between outcrops of rock across an indifferent peninsula to an apron of water below, a reverie. Or this. A sailboat sits at anchor, its sail a sheet that lists to port a verse. Grief dog. I can read that without my glasses now. <laughs> I keep thinking of dogs, of how I could use some company, a breathing thing to fill the space you left, the sound of the door you slammed still in my ears, the smell of your perfume still in the air. I keep thinking of names I might give my new pet, sad dog, grief dog, names that bounce off the ceiling, wag their way down the hall to the room with the bed I can't sleep in. I keep thinking of the movie I saw last night, the one with the dog who runs in circles, its bark no match for its bite, how it grips the leg of its owner and won't let go, teeth that dig into meat it misses. I keep thinking of my neighbor, 
not a miss or a miz, but a missus. How in winter she dresses her dog in a sweater that matches her coat. How she walks down the sidewalk, unaware of the stares of those who pass by. How the dog seems embarrassed, won't look in anyone's eyes. And neither will I. Um, my only lo local poem, Somerville Avenue. I lived until recently in Somerville, uh, just a couple blocks from Somerville, Somerville Avenue, and it was one of my favorite streets to walk down. It just, everything changes after every block, and it's like you're going through different cities, which I suppose you kind of are. Um, starts in Cambridge, goes through Somerville, Somerville ends in Boston. Um, entering the atmosphere the beat of wings grows louder, the wings not wings but wonders, as speakers hung from streetlights carol, hark, the herald angels sing. Jets lift off from Logan, their contrails parallel in late Atlantic light, hark, the angels serving cocktails, who herald flight so brightly. This checkerboard street steers cars southeast, toward Brahman vistas that hearken back to cows on the common. Underpasses pass by, so, sorry, underpasses pass by sign holding men who seek alms with palms turned weary from weather. The cars pass quickly. Flags flap half mast in wind that smells of Portuguese barbecue, no longer on the menu the lounge closed for repairs. But hark, the yellow monarchs, their wings a spotted map that waves to angels brightly. Their presence heralds spring and never-ending rain. And as we approach winter, which I'm excited about because I'm a hardcore skier, um, this is a sort of a snow poem. It's also a when I thought it was the end of pandemic poem. <clears throat> Figuration. The sadness of diplomas, of frames that hold them, of umlauts and the imperative mood, idioms and assonance and bitter pills, class and caste and paste that dries too quickly to unglue, of dial tones and minor chords and kumbaya of the tone deaf singer who won't stop crooning until the band packs up and leaves. The silence of lawn chairs in falling snow, half built houses draped in tarps, satellites that blink across night sky, their lights a pulse that leaves no trace. The sorrow of the understudy of waiting in the wings of missing scripts and words for wishes, candles that won't stay lit, of tracks in snow that weave through trees, smells that bloodhounds chase, of sirens and wine-dark seas, ears stuffed with cotton, of being buckled in, holding and being held, of empty runways and distant places no planes fly to. When this poem came out in the um, Paris Review, I had many people say, oh my God, that's the best poem about the pandemic. And I didn't know whether or not I should tell them I wrote it long before the pandemic. <laughs> you know, what do you say? Thank you. Uh, message in a bottle. I close in on facts fine as sugar poured from a bottle labeled salt, comprehend nothing. I hear a knock, then another, go to the door, but no one's there. I unlock it and leave it open. When the bottle's empty, a note pops out, its paper faded as the globe on my desk. It's unreadable. I spin the globe to see where it stops. 
It rolls off the desk and hits the door, which closes so hard it opens again. I spin the globe more gently this time. It stops where a country used to be. I am tired. I am so tired of this. Every, every time I read that poem, the last line reminds me of one of my college teachers um, who said, you cannot write a, po a poem about boredom without being boring. <laughs> <laughs> Find me one. Find me a poem that's successful, that is about boredom. And, you know, we tried. We couldn't. So the last line of that always, I wish he were alive. I would send him that poem. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the last poem I'll read. It's called, I Trust the Wind and Don't Know Why. I am not the girl in the picture. I am not the smell of hyacinths. I might be the boy. I am off the record. I am not a view from the island, not the sound of waves breaking, not parasols scattered on sand. I am closed for the season. I'm fingerprints on windows that look out on rain. I am rain that rains harder. I'm not the new fashion not hands on a clock. I don't spring forward, cannot turn back. I am yellow caution tape strung from pole to pole, police line, do not cross. I see the sky, but nothing in it, just spots on the sun, then the long twilight, then the crackle of stars. Thank you all so much. A bit like Buckingham Palace, the crossing of the guards. <laughs> Virginia Conchin is the current Amy Clampett Residency Fellow in Lenox, Massachusetts, and the author of four poetry collections, including Bel Canto and Hallelujah Time, the former praised by Diane Seuss as, quote, a metaphysical, picaresque, a mutinous epic, an elegant subversion of old school aesthetics, consumerism, marketing, and banal notions of <laughs> selfhood and soul. Her collection of short stories, Anatomical Gift, appeared in 2017, and she is also the author of four chapbooks and co-editor of the brilliant craft anthology, Marbles on the Floor, How to Assemble a Book of Poems, which appeared this year. I first met Conchin on the page, having read and taught her brilliant essay, Eight Essays on the Face, a meditation on Manet's Olympia, Frida Kahlo, and the experience of growing up with a disabled parent, which appeared in Boston Review in 2015. She was an NEH fellow in 2017, working in the archive of, of Elizabeth Bishop, where I, I met her in real life. Like Bishop, Virginia often hunts the porous edges of reality, where the land is tugging, quote, at the sea from under, and listens for the deeper wave below the roaring surf of discourses. Indeed, we can learn from her, as I think I have, how to hold Foucault in one hand and a baseball bat or a martini in the other. <laughs> in a recent poem, Published in The Common, she counsels her reader, quote, you can't bum rush an elevator. You can't expect anyone to understand a life other than their own. The queries are so many, the answers so few. But this poet does offer us answers, vital and far more than few. To read, to read a Conchin poem is to feel not only the top of your head come off, but to also see it sail across the room. <laughs> I 
that was the most beautiful, funny, and aspirational introduction I think I will ever receive in my life. That's wonderful, Heather. Thank you. I love the idea of bouncing heads and baseball bats. I think that's going to make its way into a poem. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And thank you to James and to Katie and everyone at the Garolier for hosting um, and my wonderful readers, fellow readers, Myron and Wynn. Um, I'll read a couple poems from Hallelujah Time, which uh, is came out in Canada with Vehicle Press um, in 20. 21 um and and then a couple a couple more um this one is called uh bel canto which is also the title of uh the following book um that's all i'll say <laughs> bel canto inside me is a black-eyed animal struggling to get out be free inside me is a failed attempt at explanation a frozen pizza a botched murder and a consumptive falling woman heroine. It's not love until someone is willing to die for you or quotes you out of context. Agony, St. Joan or another valorous witch going up in flames. My transpersonal gender falls asleep and has a dream it is invulnerable. My metamorphic body falls asleep and has a dream it is inevitable this slow slog towards slaughter in the form of a ruminating cow. Hand me my stilettos, hand me my Ativan, my floor length evening gown, my fainting couch, my spouse. Today is an envelope of money I will no doubt squander. Hand me my opera glasses. I want to shatter a champagne flute with my perfect contralto. I want to discomfit, then bring down the house. This one also has those kind of diva vibes, even though I'm like very far from a diva. <laughs> it's about Judy Garland. <laughs> a star is born. Don't mess with a woman from Texas. No, I'm not from Texas, but I was raised by wolves. In saying that though, am I appropriating the experience of those literally raised by wolves? as I was only using it as a metaphor for neglect, <laughs> whatever. But really, you're going to do this root canal without Novocaine? I confess, I like witty people. I credit them with having overcome the shittiness of existence. What is my greatest dream? To become a jazz pianist and see money grow on trees. It's the getting there that hurts. It's the getting there that costs a gazillion dollars or its equivalent in virgin tears. When alone, we are all Judy Garland, and that is why I want to be alone. There is no way to describe the sublimity of music entering a room suffering under a gag rule for years. If I can learn to do that, my God, I will have one. And I'll just read one poem from the end. It's, um, it's the end is like a 28 page poem sequence, uh, 27. How many letters from the alphabet? Oh, thank you. I was playing with you guys. No, this is letter. letter. <laughs> Who's awake? Not me. Um, it's an Abyssinian based on the letters of the alphabet, um, which has one more time. <laughs> I'm really just kidding. Um, this is letter G. G is for gaslighting a spell under which you convince me I'm crazy for liking to live, term originating from a 1938 play titled Same. G is for garlic, allium sativum, flowering plant praise for its curative elementary properties. G, gyroscopes, gastronomy, bathtub gin. Green is the color of the patina that grows on the surface of copper, brass, and bronze. Garth Brooks, golems, and gastric bypasses. Glamour, grammar, goodness, gavels, ghouls. Genesis's fifth day when our, when our Gnostic creator invented creatures of the sea, sky, and land. God's female, according to Ariana Grande. The final words of an auctioneer after the highest bid is offered, going, going, gone. Pablo Picasso's anti-war painting, Guernica. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Gal Gadot in the, one, in the role of Wonder Woman who went back in time to save World War I, shapeshifter of flight and invisibility. 
G, glitter, glow, gleam, intimations of a realm beyond this immortality. And I will read a few poems from about Canto. Uh, this one is just called Epistle, which is just a literary form, like a, a, a poem that is in the form of a letter. Uh, epistle. There is no sufficiency in exile. I'm accustomed to eventless days. Funny thoughts slide into my head alone on the interstate. I thought you were dead, for example. Be kind to the body, stranger that it is. Matter at odds with materialism, I'm done perishing beneath weeping willows. I need a salt lick, a fiefdom, a mylar balloon. Oh, to be nude and happy. Oh, to be Russian and asleep. Carve me a wooden idol already. Break my orbital, I mean occipital, bone. How to want what I can't have all the time. I'm tired of absence and also of sameness. The soul gets into the habit of its dreams. But there is one kiss that never ends. It lights up around your mouth. Plausible God, God of rapture. I am the ruthless brute in the stable, a singularity more idiot than savant, amorously wrecking my own shadow. You are a shard of pulverized crystal, the last known trace of Victoriana, mercuric atom resigned to desire. What human could stay so quiet, one who is secretly on fire? Um, this book was, anyone familiar with Anne Patchett's novels? So I loved the, her novel, Bel Canto, so deeply and the, um, the structure and the kind of dialogue between the hostages uh, in that situation, which it was based on a real life hostage situation in Peru. Um, and also the lyric opera that informed that book inspired this book, kind of the drama, the drama or the dramaturgy of it. And also the, um, how, uh, you know, how the lyric tradition kind of survives throughout all kinds of um, assaults on it in a way, the, just the, the song tradition uh, as well. So, uh, but that, that there are a few poems that intersect directly with music, but this is, this is one that's uh, also contains nudity, not real nudity, but references to nudity. <laughs> <laughs> the Odyssey, sometimes naked, I don't feel naked. Sometimes I feel naked when clothed. A thing breaks and we're on fire with rage. Was it supposed to enjoy eternity like us? Before Trojans were mascots or condoms, they were warriors. Before non sequiturs were digressions, they were troubadour songs. The universe is an echo chamber of discordant matter. Heaven is a fraudulent quorum of maroon demigods. I am detached from personal narrative, history, identity. Whip out a dictionary and tell me what that means. On the day the stars conspire against me, I will conquer and overcome my ugliness. Today I saw the sun rise into a bank of clouds. I want to be strong and I want not to be strong. I left the windows open. Is it raining now? The shadow is a mouth that baptizes. The shadow is a lover who won't call. You die and die and die, then you live. I think of the small white moths circumscribing the garden because they are beautiful, because they barely exist at all. And I'll just read from this one, which is about the my own personal father and fatherhood as kind of an institution. <laughs> it's called patrimony. I had a father, but he gave me away. The end of the altar like a cliff face. The same father is of the old faith. He says billions of people across human history can't be wrong, which is also an argument for populism, but I understood. He bought me umbros when I wanted pretty dresses. He said the problem with most people is that they're not hungry enough, metaphorically speaking, 
but that I didn't understand, so I refused to eat for two decades. He drove in every cardinal direction to move me from apartment to apartment during my intransigent years, helping me pack up my books and buy new futons to install in another basement efficiency, if lucky. Some had windows. Never once did he complain. He stood at soldierly attention when I went insane. The dissolution of all ability funneling from mind, leaving me motionless as a tree in winter, stunned. He calls phony dealings Mickey Mouse business. A lawyer, he enjoys rants and rhetorical displays. He speaks often about the importance of a pension. His face, after chopping wood, is red from exertion. He dragged me out of high school parties by my hair. Note the extreme austerity of an almost empty mind. You would have had to have had a thought to know one wasn't there. And then I'll just, I'll read a few new poems and uh, that I've written at the at the Amy Clampett residency, which I am so deeply honored um, to be at. And it's been an incredible experience. Um, and a lot of the poems that I've written there that um, are going into my fifth poetry manuscript now entitled Requiem are about um, solitude and privacy and also um, the, the experience of, um, a different encounter in nature than what I've had before. And I'll just, I'll just say a little bit about that toward the end, but I'll just read a few poems from that, um, from, from that manuscript. This, this poem, um, I moved back from, to Cleveland, uh, Ohio, from uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. I'd lived in Canada for eight years prior to 2022 uh, because my mother entered hospice and she's still in hospice. So this poem is called Vigil. And for anyone that's ever cared for a loved one that's been ill for a long time or near, um, um, at that stage of terminal uh, life for a long time uh, it inspired this poem, just waiting and tending and loving and caring. Vigil. Overwatered the fire lilies, underwatered the aloe, prayed to the sun god to dispel my gloom, bought perlite and peat moss, made cuttings out of dahlia, Aster, gardenia, begonia, rose. Charged crystals in the moon. Claimed knowledge panels. Accessed several past lives. Testified to my greenery of vistas yet unknown. Drank vinegar. Ate seldomly. Consulted no one except those the spirit guides approved. Was stringent, exacting. Practiced loving action. Rode my bike through abandoned streets that led to stately mansions with automated sprinklers misting trees from Brazil. Spoke candidly in private, was speechless in public. A return to civilian life without halo or word. Sought true friends, not those whom ego or mere habit serves. All this time my mother lay dying in hospice alone. I held her paper thin hand, rubbed her feet with oils, kissed her ancient forehead, embraced her body of bone. And I'll just read three more short ones. This one is a little bit humorous. It comes from the Ubisant tradition of poetry, which is Latin for where are they or where have they um, gone? Speaking of the great, noble, wonderful people and heroes of the past. So it's kind of a little bit of ironic nostalgia, especially the way that the form is conceived now. So this poem plays into that kind of ironizing of the Ubisant tradition. Uh, Ubisant, where are the good ones, the beautiful, strong and virtuous figures of yore? Probably where the moon is, hung aloft in effulgent skies, eating nails for breakfast, dying in childbirth, then resurrecting to give it all away cyclically once more. I don't want to be the moon, I said to Dick on the casting couch. I want to be a flower no one can touch without dying of hope of touching it again. Something rare and exotic, throaty stamen, purple pistol, something that just stands on the stage and screams. Alas, that role is taken, said Dick, by Suzanne. Figures, I said. How about the wild river, he suggested kindly, or a creek, brook, rivulet, rill, stream? 
But where do I empty, I asked before agreeing. In an ocean, sea, or lake, or do I just flow into the ground, a dried up shrew? That's between you and your character to decide, he said. The river, you mean, I said. Yes, he said. For God's sake, you're a woman. Just be you. <laughs> and let's be two more. Is, am I, maybe one more. Am I, am I is it? No, okay, okay. Um, these are, uh, these are just about um, enjoying the environment of the Clampett House, the beauty of the Berkshires. Um, and uh, this particular one is about um, my relationship with the crows that I've developed in the yard, who are the recipient of all of my leftovers. And I've been studying and reading a lot about crows as a result of our kind of interactions. And um, well, hopefully the poem manifests my, my admiration for them. Or similitude. The cold, the dark, the future, the terror of the vast unknown shudders my bones. Dawn breaks. I stand at the promontory of a home I do not own, at a landscape grown foreign with winter's embrace. The rustling leaves, animated by wind, trick my eye, espied first as sparrows. The trees grow more spindly by night. I am more than halfway through life a fact only recently arrived as a fact. I palm it, the inevitability of a death, sorrows and regrets that accompany youth's passing, a touristic souvenir. Beauty was posited as a capital good, adjectival clauses deployed liberally. Banquets could not fail to disappoint a mind fattened on anticipatory hope. Lower your expectations, a therapist once advised, for you and others too. As if ambitions end were peaceable. As if the crows in the yard, knowing nothing of the making of money, the handling of money, the exchange of money for goods and services, care about the manufacture of happiness, the illusion of destination, they don't. One finds the remainder of my meal, cries out to alert its family of harvest, which is to say of something provided rather than scavenged. Taste of manna from an otherworldly source that flees. They bear what I cannot without pride. The flock is gone as quickly as it came. What I've done for a paycheck, my God. What I've spent it on is scattered abroad in the bodies of living shadows, memory. And the, the last one, uh, the title is Gloria Patri. It's for my friend Chris Das, who I believe is listening tonight. Um, and it's a doxology, a short hymn of praise uh, to God in various Christian liturgies. But I take it in another direction after having spent a glorious night uh, of privacy in a, in a hotel room. Alone, just for clarification. <laughs> I feel like that needed to be mentioned. Um, Glory be to God for septic tanks, drainage pipes, for conversions thermodynamic and of the soul. Glory be to God for this quiet, cheap hotel room. Only music, the mini fridge's vibratory drone, creaky plumbing groaning through the walls. We underestimate the perfect piece of objects. Before me was another traveler. After I leave, hundreds of others will arrive anonymously, drink sink water from disposable plastic cups, recline on bleach sheets, stare into the void of a generic landscape painting across the bed while contemplating the disaster of their lives. And when the alarm wails hours before dawn, human cusses of angry protest join the chorus of budget appliances failing before their time. Why even look at a clock? It's never good news. It takes the time it takes my estimated deadline, which is likely why no employer would trust me to lead their staff toward an optimized wet dream. I'm at an age when everyone around me is dying. I'm at an age when the recited script isn't enough. Glory be to God for log jams, the antediluvial dark, for being a supply of goodness outpacing demand because so many prefer their egos, endless ranting to the suggestion of a different narrator or narrative. Me, I'm so clearly incapable of leading a brigade. I'm glad to accept help in whatever form it comes. Hour of privacy within these semen sprayed walls, 
deadbolt securing my safety from the chaos outside and the strivings of the people which are everywhere. I can't point to you on a map. I don't know your name or from whence you came, but flames lick the canvas and I acknowledge my poverty of being and my need. Glory be to God for this unforgiving mirror, this soap, this Gideon Bible tucked away in the bedside drawer. Whoever dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty, I read. A freely given gift whose only precondition is belief. It was put there for safekeeping for salesmen like me. Perhaps we should all start a, a covert campaign to uh, place inside the cover of every Gideon Bible we encounter a copy of Virginia's poem. <laughs> I think it might actually be more heartening to, uh, to our fellow travelers. Okay, so rounding out this amazing trio, Myron Hardy is assistant professor of English at Bates College in Maine and the author of six books of poetry, including most recently, Aurora Americana, and Radioactive Starlings, both published by Princeton University Press. His other collections include Approaching the Center, The Headless Saints, Catastrophic Bliss, and Kingdom, titles that begin to hint at his frequently profound meditations on nation and migration, the artificiality of temporal, national, and physical boundaries, uncanny mixtures of the foreign in the familiar and the familiar in the foreign, and nostalgia in its original etymological sense of reckoning with the pain of return. Hardy's poems have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Poetry, The New Republic, and Plowshares, and he has received several major literary prizes to include the Penn Oakland Josephine Miles Award the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and the Griot Stadler Award. Equally dexterous with both formal and free verse, Hardy's work includes deftly turned sonnets, triolets, villanelles, and guzzles, and channels imagined voices of Gwendolyn Brooks, Miles Davis, Albert Camus, and Tamir Rice, among others. His most recent book, in his own estimation, examines what it means to be, quote, on the cusp of something and asks, quote, are we on the verge of evolution or de-evolution? When we pick up a book of poems, we frequently hope to encounter one compelling unified lyric voice, but in Hardy, we often encounter a full choir and the reminders that, quote, through a door, there is always light, and quote, this is a wilderness where I reach for you. I give you Iron Hardy. Thank you so much. Um, it is truly a pleasure being here uh, and to read with Virginia and Wynne. And thank you all for being here. Can you all hear me? Am I doing something? No, it's strange. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I'd like to read mostly from my new collection, Aurora Americana. Um, and it is a book that is thinking about dawn. Most of the poems in the collection take place in or around dawn, but also the idea of beginning, newness. So. This first poem is Solemnity. At the mosque's entrance, 3.30 a.m., Syrian women beg wearing black gloves. Your father's grandmother was Syrian before the country was ash, before the government turned to kill its people. What incites that internal blaze? What says, it is me I will take, or not me? 
but those whom I claim. We're claimed after meditation. We're walking an empty street after pretending to play drums. After I recognize the heather in air, after we swim in a pool surrounded by azaleas, after your mother smiles observing us, after we sleep in her house, fields of sunflowers, I'm on a bus watching them sway. I'm forgetting the distance, the inevitable loss I will hold warm as snow whitens the green. What will you hold? What will you see beyond your hands? Streets lined with jacarandas that morph to pines, to a self beneath ice that wolves trample silently. Someone still begs. Someone still believes in our innate generosity. You're waiting for me, but refuse to say it. You believe in returns. You believe in the planet's roundness. You believe in gravity's inaudible assurance. You believe in what I doubt. Okay, so there once was a moth. And that moth decided to live in a dryer. As I dried my clothes, the moth appeared out of nowhere, but in the eye of the dryer, I kept watching the clothes spinning and the moth inside. And I opened the dryer, trying to, trying to get the moth out. The moth didn't get out. This happened about five times, I gave up. So um, this poem is called The Moth in the Dryer. <laughs> Among the cyclone of my shirts, I see your beige flutter. The paper you are among cotton dyed, drying. I open the dryer door, but you don't emerge from that artificial heat, that fatal swirl of dead plants. Fumbling through the shirts, you are nowhere until the door is closed, the spinning. You flutter in the eye of it, a thing struggling, struggle itself among that which will kill. Outside, the pungency of pesticides sprayed the previous night makes me cough. Your wings have detached. You're swirling with the cyclone as a boy blows a sphere of thistles detached into a field of Queen Anne's lace. He is alone, but speaks as if he were not. The swifts see him as they dash, assail the moths remaining. What airplanes sprayed over soy fields killed my aunt, Jenny Lee. We are so small here. All right, so um, I lived in North Africa for nine years, and I remember being in Tunisia, in Tunis, and I was sitting at a cafe, and someone came up to me and said, did you know that Frantz Fanon sat at that cafe? I said, no. <laughs> um, but <laughs> it's interesting, though. Um, traveling throughout North Africa. I remember one time being in Algiers, just wandering through the city and then looking up and I was on France Fanon Boulevard. So there's several of these poems that have Fanon's name in them. Um, so here's one of those. This is called Fanon in Tunis, after Tunis. Speak of exile in a dank room. Write that word on damp paper before opening blue shutters. Before leaving the apartment for the street, before coughing after your first sip of coffee, before recalling the creek, I'm asking why the world has become this. Silent sirens, this epidemic, this twisting of a wretched thing. 
This was perhaps your question, but you had an answer. Spoke to it at the university. Then, that evening, surprised by the purple scatterings on the streets. So fragile, strange even, this life against stove. You're sipping coffee, watching people pass each other. After you've passed, I'm watching people pass each other, yet I'm sipping tea. You loved poetry. You brought others to hear Cesar. Now, the poet is perpetually exiled. Now, because of then. Now, because of now. Now, because we're now. I'm trying to find something that is, uh, well, different, a little different. Um, so this poem is called, Sometimes I Believe I'm a Moroccan Poet Exiled on Mars. I'm from Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm from the middle of another country. My cells are snow crystals that faults perpetually break used to others. I see red, violet in an opal sky. In autumn, the pies are pumpkin, cherry. But for nine years, I've written poems near seawater, on beaches where camels graze, longing not to see seas. But I want to see them. Not storms swirling pages to ash, so much red moving clockwise, counter. Where are the clocks? Time as pastoral. The budding, bursting, the flight of seeds, the spheres of hay wound on land, purged. But all I see is dust. My hand in dust. I'm writing in dust. What I'm writing will become dust. I'm the premonition of dust exiled here. All right. So this is Anna Baud, a dawn poem. A Baud, troposphere. I'm mourning what will be lost these crystals over us, a castle's ephemeral shine. This is what the troposphere makes. We're watched by something other than eyes. We see ourselves as beings sprung from river rocks. We are the only ones aware of a particular chill, the necessity of restlessness of restless return. The cafe where we decide to wait doesn't close. The medicine bottles on each table hold a single ranunculus. You speak of rhythm, its persistence despite uproot, cutting, cold. This moment will not survive the constant tug I see it. Oh, love, look. All right, how is my time? Good. Good? <laughs> okay. All right, so uh, this poem is thinking about um, the World Cup, it's thinking about France, it's thinking about my last Saturday in Morocco. It's also thinking about the sort of migrant crisis through the Mediterranean or of the, Medi of the Mediterranean. And there's an epigraph. The poem is called The Champions and the epigraph is the black players of France are also black players from the entire black world, Gregory Perrault. 
Too much rain over Moscow, but a prime minister kisses the champions on their foreheads. His dark suit slick with water. The champions are soaked as if they floated from the sea, but they are jubilant. So many Africans are floating in the sea, are drowning among plastic, whitening coral. These champions know of the drowning, the desperation that comes from besieged land, those who wish them besieged. Not them, not today, but how cannons blast gold foil squares that stick to skin, ground. It is my last Saturday in Morocco. We are praising victory. How much gold are we worth? Decisions, decisions. Okay, this is about a spaceship. And Tamri, which is where this spaceship lands, in my imagination, um, is a small village in the south of Morocco. The spaceship in Tamri. Above it was a sign welcoming refugees, a poster of Sonny Rollins blowing the world into another. The roof is gone, burned away so it could land where it could. The aliens we are recognize its jeweled lights, its saffron smoke. Save us from this restlessness as our armor flakes. What we make makes this place burn. Our joy of burning joy into atmosphere, but this air isn't owned by the joyous. Something other rules, claims possession of what we breathe, the rays on our skin. We're practicing song without saxophone, drum, something stringed, jeweled as olive branches thrash. We have wept in Florence, have reddened in Shingiti, have understood this place as merely itself, but save us from this. That afternoon, the fish was cooked with cauliflower, eaten with torn bread, green oil that smelled of rosemary. The fisherman smelled rosemary in wind. He saw the sky burning. The red village burns. Save that which burns. Save us from their burning. And, and I'll read one more and this is a newer poem it's called the name your brother gives his son your name your name because he is here you away from your town cluttered with sheep your brother's new town has more sheep than gravel. You tell me this from Paris. You tell me this as you protest a murder, the throng around you protesting a murder here, there. You call me your American brother in Maine. Your brother is saying your name, calling your name in the dust calling his son in the dust. We once walked in the dust, palms over scratched eyes. I'm afraid of dust, how it is us. 
how we become it, how it is surrender. Your brother has given his son your name. Which name do you know? Thank you very much. Let's give the poets another round of applause. Thank you, everybody, for coming. If you could please all move your chairs up against one of the walls. We have some books for sale. Poets will be signing books. Thank you. Yes, I enjoyed your work. Um, it's funny. I I'm writing a novel as well. Oh yeah. I have a man. And you're from Michigan. I am too. Oh, you're from Michigan. Oh, wow. <laughs> Where in Michigan? Uh, Rochester. Okay. I'm from South Carolina. All on retainer. <laughs> Oh, so you don't know these? You don't know my friends? No, I, well, I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I like to sometimes. Yeah, because sometimes when I read from a book, I have difficulty turning the page and then we can get stuff together. So with this, it's just like, yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, October is published. <laughs> I live in Montreal. Okay. Um, which obviously is you know multiple languages, yes. mostly mostly yeah, actual French and yeah, English. But he was he was saying to me he was they were kind of wondering a lot if some of the books in our um, if they were like translated from a, another language, whether Arabic or French, like into English. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes. Um, some of these poems I was trying to write in Arabic and then I would say them in English. Oh, sort of chain. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Oh, it's just this strange process that I started yeah. doing. Well, it's like kind of spontaneous while, while you were living there. Yeah, while, okay. while I was living there, yeah. I'm like, okay, like, how can I put this in another language and then see what the other language can do? Yeah. 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 Well, like, yeah. like orally and like, exactly. yeah, yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. And do you speak or write in Arabic? Uh, or in Moroccan Arabic. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Arabic, Arabic. I'm still working on that. Okay. Okay. That's, yeah. okay. And another yeah. whole like, yeah. Whole thing. Well, um, so no, it's, it's, it's Moroccan Arabic kind of like, like Haitian like, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I guess, yeah. Like, like, like just a der derivation, yes. but like close enough to Yeah. Exactly. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think Arabic is, would be such a challenging language yeah. to learn, but yeah. 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 It's always, I mean, it seems to always change. Whenever I go back, they're speaking in a different way. It's like, what? That's what I was right. like, I don't know that word or what? Is, or... You're like, so glad I'm coming back to the country where I'm coming in this language. Right. And, like, what? and then I said, well, is, are you speaking Arabic? Arabic? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what I love about it. Like all the nuance just goes. No, I, I, I love it. I'm looking at a way that. Native language is like, 
exactly in relation to language and i think especially for it's so hard <laughs> And I don't think yeah. a lot of American poets, I think, don't have even that experience. Um, starting about or with you know wrestling 